This is a HeadGum Podcast. The Dagger Chronicles, a new vampire series by paranormal fiction writer Janice Jones, introduces the next generation vampire hunter, Alexa Stone. Meet Alex and her team in book one, In Her Blood, available now at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and AmberJackPublishing.com. Book two by Bloodsworn, coming soon. And remember, the power is in her blood. Deep in the heart of Texas. Deep in the heart of Texas, there's a lot of fun places to shop. And in Dallas, particularly, there's a certain place that sells carnivorous plants. It's called the Texas Triffid Ranch. It's Dallas's only carnivorous plant gallery, specializing in unique custom plant enclosures, commissions, and rentals. So go to www. Dot txtrifidranch.com that's www.txtrfidranch.com odd plants and oddities for odd people Hey, this is Jada Pinkett Smith, and you're listening to Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Jake Choi. I'm an actor. Uh, I've been in, I guess, uh, TV dramas and comedies like Law and Order SVU, Broad City, Younger, and um, you are listening to the one and only Black Girl Nerds Podcast. This is LaToya Morgan. I am a writer on Into the Badlands, and you are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Peace, y'all. What's up? This is Akil, the MC from the Jurassic 5, and you are now tuned in to Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Yeah, I like nerdy girls. Hi, I'm Kyla Fry. I'm an actress and being the change that we want to see, and I'm here with Black Girl Nerds. Listen in. My name is Reggae Jean Page. I play Chicken George in Roots, and you are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hi, I'm Vincent Jerome, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hi, everyone. This is Samira Wiley from Orange is the New Black. I've got a couple things coming up. I'm going to be in a movie called 37 that I hope everyone goes and checks out. It's important. And I'm currently working on The Handmaid's Tale, which should be coming out next year, 2017. And you're listening to Black Girl Nerd Podcast. tuning into episode 97 of the Black Girl Nerds podcast. My name is Jamie, and I am your host. This episode is titled Jean Grey, Moana, and Beyond TV Series. Three segments. In our first segment, we invite the one, the only, the prolific Jean Grey, hip-hop recording artist and comedian. Jean Grey talks about her work in the industry 
as well as give commentary about the current political climate that we're in. That segment is hosted by yours truly and co-hosted by Grace and Tora. In our second segment, Joelle sits down in a one-on-one interview with Alihi Cravalho of the Disney film Moana. Alihi plays the title role as Moana in this mythical tale that takes place in the South Pacific. Also co-stars Dwayne The Rock Johnson and original music by Lin-Manuel Miranda. In our third segment, back at New York Comic Con, Abby White sits down with the series creators as well as one of the actors behind the new show called Beyond, scheduled to premiere in January. And this interview features series creators Tim Kring, David Icke, and actor Berkeley Duffield. So that's it. That is our show, fully packed. Make sure to do the following subscribe to us on iTunes, leave us a comment. Also follow us on SoundCloud and feel free to always leave comments on there and let us know what you think of these segments, what do you think of the show. I also want to make one quick note. The Black Girl Nerds podcast is going on a hiatus for the holiday season. We all need to take a little bit of a break. And also I'm working on some projects in the background. So I need time for research and development there. But stay tuned for an announcement of a new show that I'm currently working on that will premiere next year. In the meantime, happy holidays. Enjoy this time with your family. Enjoy this time with your friends. And give yourself a chance to just rest and relax. I know that there's a lot going on and it's a really stressful time for many of us. But just take this time to relax with your family sit back and have lots and lots of really good food and desserts and have fun at your gatherings this holiday season and the bgm podcast we'll see you back in january so this is episode 97 jean gray moana and beyond tv series enjoy Jean Grey is a hip-hop recording artist from Brooklyn, New York. She rose to prominence in the underground hip-hop scene in New York City and has since built an international fan base. Throughout her career, she's recorded tracks with numerous hip-hop artists, including The Roots, Talib Kweli, and Most Def. Grey's recorded an unreleased album and celebrated with North Carolina producer Ninth Wonder of Little Brother fame entitled Genius. She's also the writer and director of a web-based sitcom called Life with Jeannie, which gives a unique perspective about her own personal experiences. Welcome to this segment of the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. My name is Jamie. I am your host. Incredibly excited for this guest that we have on tonight, who's going to talk to us about all things related to pop culture and entertainment and music especially, we have the one, the only, Jean Grey here to talk to us, and she is a hip-hop artist, also a writer and director, and we are so excited to have you on our show. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm I'm so happy to be on. Um, I'm not going to yell at you guys yet and be like, why did it take this long? <laughs> I've been I've just been sitting in my living room crying, um, waiting for you guys, but that's okay. The tears are gone now. You can wipe those tears away now. Yeah. I'm I'm just yeah, I'm just letting them fall right into my vodka and then just putting them (laughs) back into my body. It's it's the cycle of life. Uh, Vodka and tears. Vodka and tears. And we have our lovely co-hosts, Grace and Tora. Thank you, ladies, for coming on. Super psyched, yes. Just excited to be here. Just really happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 about to be, I'm about to be geeking out myself, too, so, yeah. <laughs> um, um, before we start, cur- cursing is, is fine, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, oh, love how every- <laughs> I love how everybody asks us that. Like, I guess right. we you- don't curse a lot, so people assume it's like, a no yeah. kind of thing like it's off limits but yeah feel free be yourself be you. fucking all right 
So, so Jean, for some of our listeners who don't know of your work, tell us how you got started in the hip hop industry and how did you come up with the name Jean Grey? Um, so, uh, man, it was a, it was a very, very long time ago. It was about, uh, 1953 cause I'm old. Um, <laughs> And thank you guys for laughing immediately and not being like, really, 1953. Um, I actually um, uh, put out, I think the first vinyl I was ever on, the first record I ever put out was in like 90, 96 or something. And uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to make music. I was a DJ at first and then I was a producer and I was kind of giving beats to everyone uh, around and realized that I could probably um out rap all the dudes I was around um which was true um and so I was like let me let me just try my hand at it and uh, a friend of mine was like we should record some songs together and uh we ended up recording it and sending it in to the source magazines they had this section called unsigned hype and um the name of our group was ground zero and at the time my name was what what cuz I thought it was hilarious uh, as, you know, as, you know, someone asks you your name and you answer what, what, and it turns into an Abbott Costello routine and nobody ever gets an answer. Um, and uh, so we sent it in and, and we ended up in, in unsigned hype. And I was like, oh, well, shit, I, I guess I'm doing this now. So it was, it was a very accidental um, kind of thing. And I knew I wanted to write and I'd, you know, since after that, joined another group called Natural Resource. Um, and uh, then we formed our own independent label and put out our own music um, and kind of just never stopped after that. And I think when people ask a question, be like, so what like, made you want to be a rapper? My answer was always, I still haven't decided uh, if that's what I want to do. So it, it was an accident. Wow. Did yeah. you did you read any of uh X Men growing up? Were you inspired at all by the character? Yeah, I um my brother uh was a huge, huge comic book fan and um we grew up right next door to a, a, a comic book store and uh ended up in there a lot. Um and I remember when I was about like four or five, my best friend like we used to we, we would play X Men and uh, I just remember the first day she was like, you be Storm. And I was like, oh, I see why. I see. I, I get it. Like, what if I don't want to be? What if I want to be Magneto? Damn it. Um, right. But, right. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. So the the change in, in Jean Grey and uh, in, in changing my name to Jean Grey actually happened um, when I was uh, realizing that I really wanted to be a solo artist about like 1999, 2000. And um, a very good friend of mine uh, who just passed away uh, not too long ago named uh, Pumpkinhead um, suggested Jean Grey. And I, and I was like, that that sounds good. Also a, a hard name to live up to, but I, I think I'll, I'll be okay. That's what's up. I, I love Jean Grey. I mean, it's one of the best, I think one of the best superhero powers in comics yeah. was Jean Grey's powers, for sure. Uh, and you know, yeah, the the uh, the the story of, you know, there's a lot of uh, deaths and and rebirths and alternate lives, um, yeah. and tr- trying to you know travel around to time to to be like, I let me see if I can fix things or make it better. And then I think also a, a big part of it is the reluctance to be a superhero at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, like I don't you know necessarily want to do this. I'm out. <laughs> Let me go live my life right. in an alternate timeline. I'm like, fuck yeah! I know every day, every day I want to do that. Um, so, so a lot of things related to me. You blend a lot of your music into intersections of hip hop and nerd culture. Would you label yourself a nerdcore artist? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a no. I, uh, that's gonna be a no for me. Um, I I I've seen myself called a nerdcore artist once, and I was like, you know, uh, especially with women, um, 
in hip hop or or whatever it is career you choose there's always a need to put uh some sort of word or adjective or something before your job mm. even you know before like it's female and then you got to put something before that i'm like really why can't just just say the thing it's fine it's fine to just say what the fuck it is i do um and i think uh I, i've never been i've i've been miscategorized so many times either as, you know, a uh, uh, conscious MC. And I'm like, I, I would get that just due to um, the company uh, I was keeping. Um, but it, it always bothered me because I think it was more of a um, just a perception mm-hmm. of kind of what what you want someone to do and what you want someone to be. And even with listening to the music, like not really listening to it. I'm like, because most of my... It's a lot of murder. Like I mostly just killed a lot of people in songs. And then um, (laughs) it's pop culture references and then a lot of killing and and dudes. And then that was that was about it. Love it. Wow. Yes. Well, let me just put this plug in. So, like, I still listen to your Cookies and Coma uh, mixtape, like still one of my favorite ones that I love to listen to. So um, and as oh, and this is Grace, by the way, um, Hi. As Hi. this great, prolific. Because I'm, I'm going to say you're prolific. Good, because I am. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, you 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 know, you kind of mentioned about, you know, being on the production side of the hip hop music business. So can you speak on like the influence and importance, you know, of someone like you, you know, particularly a black woman in the presence of hip hop production? Uh, first off, thank you for asking me that and talking about it. Um, I was just talking to an, uh, another uh, lady who who has been producing and, and and engineering and doing stuff for years and um discussing the idea that you know as many times as you talk about your music i can and as many interviews as it's been over like 20 years i can count on one hand the number of times that i've been asked about production Mm -hmm. which is fucked up it doesn't make any sense and i'm like well who did who who did you think was making the music like there's no other credits on the album what (laughs) like some some dude had to magically like show up and do that because it couldn't possibly be me um, I, uh, I, I left high school early and I, I got my engineering degree. So I was about 16 or so. And, um, so I've, I've been engineering for a long, for, you know, as, as, uh, almost as long as I've been producing, which is, you know, since about 16. Wow. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, out of the, I think it's like 23 albums now, um, mm-hmm. Amazing. I've done 19 of them myself Whew. and it's, you know, not just producing, it's recording, engineering, mixing. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's so interesting that, that, that never gets brought up as, as a, as a thing. Right. Um, so it, it kind of just started to be like, all right, well, I guess we just expect you to do it or we don't know how it happens. It's magic, but you're a lady. So <laughs> how could that be happening? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely kudos on to that. And then, so in addition to your production and your musical contributions, um, you also contributed to the A Nation Under Our Feet storyline for Ta-Nehisi Coates' Black Panther. I did. And I also noticed that you have taken an interest in comedy. So, or you ha- you have that, uh, I've seen a couple of clips and videos. So what brought upon that venture and how, if any, do you mesh it with, you know, hip hop at all or, or do you not? I mean, um, uh, com- comedy wise, I-, I think, you know, as far as it goes, uh, tying it into hip hop, my, my shit has always been funny and there's always been jokes and, and stuff hidden. And like my first album was called Attack of the Attacking Things. Yeah. Like it's not, I couldn't think of anything good that attacked. I was like, this is good. We'll just go with this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's it's I've I've been doing that for years and in terms of, you know, trying to craft like smart punchlines and, and uh, you know, jokes that that I hopefully have been witty. Um I and and comedy is just something I've been wanting to do for a long time and I you know, think I've done everything else. I've been a, a writer, I've been doing all these other things and, and that was kind of the last 
thing that was left that I was like, why are you so afraid to go do this? Just get on the stage and just just try it, see what happens. Um, and I think it's also something that I started doing in my shows about there was always a lot of crowd work and interaction. And mm-hmm. once I started really getting to an age where I was like, I'd give minus 15 fucks. Um, <laughs> like, let, <laughs> let me Not see. Zero, but minus, no, minus, minus, minus 15. 15. Um, let me see how much more crowd work I can do. And, and, and really, really started finding my voice. And I'm like, if I have an hour and a half show, how can I make it possible that I'm only doing like four songs and the audience won't notice? <laughs> and <laughs> the idea is, you know, to be interactive, to uh, to to tell jokes and to do crowd work. Um, and and jumping into the the comedy world, they were extremely welcoming, and I think it was more, way more so than rap. Um, I was like, you know. It, if it feels like you finally walked into uh, the school for gifted children and you were like, Oh, 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 here y'all are. Thank you. (laughs) Okay. So uh, as evident by obviously the Jean Grey moniker and what you've told us um, about living next to the comic book store and going in, obviously you are a black girl nerd. So what is something that you've done in your career or life that most qualifies you for the nerdy title? Like what's the, what's something that you're like, yeah, that's definitely the nerdiest. (laughs) Uh, Um, I, I, there are a lot of fucking things first off. Um, (laughs) Yes. The whole, let's just spend a whole day on that. Um, (laughs) There's a lot of situations I, you know, can find myself in. And I think it's when you find uh, other people who really like dissecting the the language and the way that um, uh, patterns and words and phrases work. And and you realize uh, how much it is another instrument and, and, and the technicality in it. So I think doing stuff like getting into those conversations makes me so happy. I'm like, oh, we get to take words apart and then put them. <laughs> that that <laughs> that that feels incredible to me. Um, I think the most happy nerd time I've had uh, was Comic Con, specifically this year, um, signing at the Marvel booth. Because mm. nice. that that was like oh you're big you time guys. <laughs> I am <laughs> the Marvel booth come on now that's that's, right. that's big things right there yeah uh, that and um and being in uh and being in Deadpool was possibly the the warmest nerd heart I've ever had in my life one of the best movies this year <laughs> yes. no no the, no the comic book. Oh, the, oh, hey, that's even better. <laughs> which <laughs> issue, which issue of Deadpool were you in? Yes, you gotta go find that black girl. Yeah, yeah, Why, don't yeah. you know that? Why don't you know when black girls be up in comics? I need to find this out. Scavenger <laughs> yeah, <your> hunt. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're gonna go do this. And, yeah, <laughs> On the I, Google's right now, but I'm trying to do it, like, so you can't hear my clicking. <laughs> it's like, it's too late. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I got to punch Deadpool in the face. That so. is what's up. So that is, oh, yes. that is what. The, so shout out to Mike Hawthorne, because I I initially was just like, hey, I know you're drawing Deadpool. Can you just draw me and Deadpool in like a sexy scene so I could put it up in my house like he's my boyfriend? Um, and and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, let me do you one better. I was like, well, it's not really better, but but it's no, it's great, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I did want a sex scene, but okay. Awesome. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> so you're so naturally talented and multi-talented, dynamic. It seems like you've been able to effortlessly move between the boundaries of being an MC, an actor, and a comedian. But I know it can't be effortless. So what kinds of struggles have you created, have you faced trying to create content that defies boundaries and labels? Would it, would, would you feel a way if I told you that for me it was effortless? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is. I, I, you know, I, um, I, I was raised by uh, an amazing woman who, you know, a, a creative genius in her own right and far, far ahead of her time um, as a musician and as, as a composer, as a manager, as a mom, as all of those things um, who taught me to that, you know, I, I had limitless potential. And I think the 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 difficult part is is not doing it myself or being like eh, I'm gonna go do this shit now and if it doesn't work out then you know you, you take it back you you figure something out and 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 you rework it and you do it again and you can live as many lives as you want to um, I think the difficult part and 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 kind of the heartbreaking part but I think hip hop uh, at, at least you know I, I got to have a few fights enough fights with that to 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 be bruised up and up enough and have a tougher skin. The hardest part is getting out into the world and then them being like, oh, no, no, you don't do that. You don't even do that. We're going to completely ignore those other things. This is who you are. Um, So that's been the, the, the most important fight. And for me, because we don't encourage just kids in general or people in general to be polymaths anymore, um, is so important is so important for you know uh for for little girls of color to be able to see someone and be like I can do all of those things you don't have to put any categories on it you do have limitless potential you can do whatever you want and it's going to suck <laughs> it's going to be really hard but yeah there's there's no if if you feel like you want to go become something else the next day or for the next 10 years or for the next 20 years and you can switch up and you can fucking do whatever it is and and for adults too adult adults need to hear that <laughs> true indeed true indeed yeah. they do i completely agree i i guess i just so much of your okay so I'm a big fan of that's not how you do that either. And I was thank you. <laughs> I was trying to put my best friend on to it and I was trying to explain to him what it was. And I was talking about I was trying to define it and so much of what you do as someone who's multi talented is create content that's kind of just outside of you know, what can be defined by specific boundaries. So I was just like, you know, it's like music, but it's, <laughs> it, it's, so, it's also, yeah. this, uh, <laughs> so, and, and, I but I, I think that's important. I think, I exactly. think that's important just for all of us that we don't necessarily have to fucking fall into those categories. And, right. and, you know, I think, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to find something that doesn't have a blueprint. Um, but it's also hard as shit to follow something that doesn't have a blueprint you know you you can do whatever you want it's 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 like being an artist and not having a day job like yeah your schedule is open and you don't have to answer to anyone but also yeah your schedule is open and you don't have to answer to anyone now what are you gonna do yeah (laughs) so i loved that information video and the golden probe awards were Hilarious. So <laughs> can you tell us more about the Lady Parts Justice League and its goals? Um, basically, it's, you know, uh, please stop being monsters, <laughs> women, um, <laughs> because we're people who can make our own choices and decisions with our bodies. And I, I don't see how anyone could kind of, you know, not support that unless you're well, unless you're half of America. Um, mm-hmm. But <laughs> for for the rest of us, uh, you know, it's it's very important to me that um, women have access to the information, because I, I think that's a lot of the issue. And I think that's, you know, in in general, a lot of the, the, the issues with. America are that there is the information out there and either we don't know where to get it or we're so inundated with all the other shit that's going on in life that we're not even getting on the internet and being able to type in and being like, what can I do? Or, you know, the women who are so busy taking care of families and just trying to survive and get by, there's no fucking time to be like, let me go Google this shit. Um, (laughs) When, when the fuck are you finding time to do that? Um, 
So it's it's incredibly important to me to to start having vehicles that are reaching out and saying, listen, these are the laws. This is what you need to know. This is what's available. This is what's changing and and doing something to get that information out there, even even if it's not, hey, we're changing this right away. It's awareness. You got to be aware of your environment and and what the government is being like. No, you can't fucking have this. That's incredibly important. It is. It is. And we've, you know, been kind of laughing and joking and geeking out about comics and music and creating your own art. But I did want to get a little serious for just a moment and talk about the election of Cheeto Jesus. Uh. Uh, (laughs) um, How much of an impact with what Uh. is happening now? I know. I know. Can that just just be my answer right now? Just just for five minutes. (laughs) The (sighs) sigh of exasperation. That is your answer. Got it. Um, But but with whatever with everything that's happening with the election, um, how do you feel like that's going to affect you as an artist? And do you think artists of color have a responsibility to speak up and out against Trump? Um, Here's. You know, before anything affects me as as an artist, and I've I've spent um, against my will the bigger half of this week um, listening to a lot of white people before I just started snapping and being like, please just shut up. Um, <laughs> just be so distraught and uh, so shocked and right. uh, wanting to talk about their families and wanting to talk about their feelings. And I think my responses at first were like, OK, well, let's give it a chance. Like for two days, I was OK. And after that, I was like, I don't I don't fucking care. I don't know. Get it together. I don't know. Go. Y'all got to go talk about that shit somewhere else. You have to understand that this is not the first time in my life I feel like this. This is not the first time in a decade I feel like this. This is not the first time in, in this year that I've just been done just been fucking done just i don't want to get up i'm just crying i don't want my family to go outside i don't want my loved ones to go outside like you like you know thank you for it it, it's good to see you here i'm not saying that but um (laughs) but you also have you know the ability to disappear and get the fuck out of here and then we're still left here by ourselves so i i can't necessarily believe anything um it's it's been hard in general to make art that is um, either uh, politically involved or 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 socially involved. Um, And it's been hard to make art and put it out when you just need to make rent. And that's kind of the thing you do. But you can't because somebody else got fucking shot and it's it it doesn't fucking feel appropriate, you know, Um, and yes, you, you, you do have a responsibility. You do have a responsibility to do that, but you also have a responsibility to live and, and it to not just be survival. Um, I wish that the responsibility would stop falling solely on us. It's fucking tiring. I'm exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I'm <laughs> fucking exhausted. Mm-hmm. And. You know, in in days when I want to talk about something else or think about, I can't even get there in my brain, you know, just no matter where it is where I'm going, um, let alone to get there in in, in art or feeling, you know, uh, like I have to talk about it in person or on or on stage or wherever I am um, is everybody's responsibility. Um, and what I would like to see is white people take up that fucking responsibility right now because they haven't. Uh, so I've been, I've been, I've been yelling a lot about that (laughs) to whatever (laughs) audience I've had. Um, I also run a church which exists every other Sunday at union hall. It's a non-denominational, um, choir sermons, everything. And so, you know, it was, it was a, a, a big heavy, service on Sunday and you know that was that was a lot of the conversation um and I'm like I let can I can I if I take a nap are y'all gonna like handle it 
or do I have to <laughs> do I have to fucking keep going till I till till we all pass out because we're exhausted, we're tired, and we're done. Um, and then you know, then I'm a woman, and then I'm an African immigrant, and then I have a Muslim name. Um, and immediately the conversation with my boyfriend is, you know, what like. What, what what do we do? Do I do we get married immediately? So I change my last name. Are we leaving the country? Where do we go? Mm-hmm. And you start looking at other countries, and you're like, oh, I can't even pick this first because if we want to go to Italy, I gotta Google which place in Italy is the least racist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's <laughs> there's so many layers to it that are just exhausting at every fucking turn. Um, but I. I think the 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 shit is and 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 as you guys know you just I'm I don't know I wish we weren't used to it but we're fucking used to it yeah yeah, yeah. so true Ooh. what what are your thoughts about the <laughs> the whole safety pin situation oh, okay, oh fuck it <laughs> well here <laughs> ah fucking safety pin um I also at a service i had a you know a bunch of cards to hand out to people and a lot of them are just uh very normal you know cards is you know sort of motivational that just say i love you you know uh you're amazing whatever that thing is you need to go do you need to go do that shit right now just because sometimes people need to hear that but the last card i made was um while we are in this public space if anything happens that makes you uncomfortable or threatens your safety, I'm going to defend and protect you. Uh, but I asked, where are the white men in the room? And I was like, I'll give five out to everybody in here. Every white man in this room, you get 15 of them. Sure. Um, and this is not a, hey, I'm just wearing a fucking pin. I'm g-. If, if you're doing that, you are looking someone in the face and you're saying I'm in that space at the same time and you are making yourself responsible because all the rest of it is just more passive aggressive fucking bullshit. And it was never time for that, but it's really not time for that. Mm. Y'all okay? Yeah, that's good. Just, just yeah. got to soak that all in. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's real, that's real. Um, well, speaking of like responsibility and, you know, oftentimes, you know, we look at comics and, you know, the characters and how they kind of like portray certain responsibilities and kind of like to go back to like when you got your name and, and how that kind of came to be. How much do you see of yourself or like even your personality in your character namesake, Jean oh. Grey? Um, then I think early 20s me thought that I was that mm-hmm. I think you know <laughs> if if um we we go back in time and 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 you always think you know how much the fuck you know and you think you're such a grown adult and then you actually get to be an adult and you're like I didn't know shit I didn't know shit about me I didn't know shit about the world um I I really did think so I think for me, um, a lot of things I do and, and, and the way I work and even record or make things is I kind of I work backwards from the future. Mm. Uh, so I'm I'm already at the end of the of project and and now I have to actually go back and make it. Um, I think it was kind of the same thing and and kind of foreseeing all the all the things and knowing the things that I I wanted to do. I've had a five year, 10 year, 20 year, 50 year plan for everything for a long, long time. Cause I believe in fucking making plans so that, um, I can drink along the way and know that there's a plan already set. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. I love that. <laughs> You're like, no, it's good. I got a plan. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know how many things I would have to go through in order to really own that name. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought I was ready, but, um, but I, I wasn't necessarily ready. And, uh, I think there are definitely parts of me. I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly Jean Grey, but I'm a lot Deadpool. I'm a- <laughs> <laughs> As I got older, I started to get a lot more Deadpool. Um, 
but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think I, I could have chosen a, a better one. It was a good, good, good choice, little me. Good yes. job. I agree. I concur. <laughs> I think Thank the you. evolution and the changing kind of is what makes you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I, I think <laughs> it's, it's gotta be like that for everyone. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't believe in any like if if you're the same person that you were at like two years ago or a fucking year ago or six months ago, then you're doing some shit wrong. Like you got to you got to evolve and you got to learn from all that shit and you got to make some new shit happen. Um, so I'm 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 very much about the the evolution. Yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> you're so quiet. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, we're absorbing. Like, this is great. We we really love and appreciate everything that you've shared with us tonight. And I just just wanted to say that I, I, um, I'm, I'm really, really proud of you guys. And, you know, especially coming from a, a, a time where it was just kind of me out there as, as lone black girl nerd and having to explain it to people or people not understanding what was going on or why I would know the things I would know. Um, it's so, it's so fucking nice to have, it really is. You guys are so important. Just so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for for the inspiration too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming on our show. Thank you for your work and to all of our listeners, where can they find you on the interwebs and give us your social media shout outs? Yeah. Don't fucking follow me. I don't like that shit. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, you can find me on Twitter at at Jean Greasy. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at at Jeannie Grigio. Just figure out how to spell it. I'm the one with a lot of people. Um, you can't <laughs> find me on Facebook um, because fuck Facebook. Uh, I admire I, that I just, so much. I, oh, my God. Yeah. I am it's on not, the it, fringes of deactivating my account right now. Well, well let me Facebook. tell you this. You know, when you try to deactivate it, they give you like this two week window. Like you can't deactivate it right away. And then you can't sign in. If you sign, if you go back and sign in immediately, um, they just reactivate it. So if you're going to do it, you got to cut it the fuck off. I haven't missed it. I'm fine without it. Everything's good. Um, you can also support my Patreon uh, at patreon.com slash Gene Gray. And there's a lot of stuff going on over there. Um, there's a great video if you want to watch it. It kind of explains everything. But a lot of the things uh, that I put out or release that aren't necessarily music, you get there first. Um, you can also check out, if you're in New York, every other Sunday, uh, the Church of the Infinite You at Union Hall. And you can check out the first Wednesdays of every month, my live talk show, The Show Show, also at Union Hall. What's up? What's up? I do things. <laughs> All, the things. <laughs> All the things. Yes. Thank Everything. you. Thank you so much for coming on. This was great. Thank you for having me. Alihi Cravalo plays the role of Moana in the next Walt Disney Animation Studio release film by Walt Disney Pictures. In the film Moana, on a mystic island in Polynesia, she plays a 16-year-old strong-willed daughter of the chief of the tribe, Moana from Matuni Island, and is chosen by the ocean itself to reunite the heart of Te Fiti. She sets sail in search of Maui, a legendary demigod, and hopes to save her people. Moana is scheduled to release in theaters nationwide on November 23rd. So they taught me a trick to say your name, <laughs> which is so cute. And he said, Al, like you said your toe, E, Lee, is that right? Lee, like Bruce Lee, and then Adam. And then the E at the end. Say it for me, Al, E, Lee? Al, E, Al, E, E. Well, thank done. you. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I've heard Black Girl Nerds, just want to dive right in. Do you consider yourself nerdy at all? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. What I are you a nerd for? Um, molecular cell biology. Wow! <laughs> Holy cow! Okay, so like real life science are cool. Kind of, yeah. How'd you get into that? Um, I was part of an honors biology program when I was in freshman uh, freshman year of high school, and then um, during the summer, actually, my freshman summer, 
I worked on a research project about how our sunscreen actually affects our natural reefs, which was a big problem, wow. I think, in Hawaii and with the whole global kind of impact we're having, I was focusing on that. And then Mona came into the picture. So, <laughs> so I kind of had to shift my focus, but I've been really into molecular biology since that. And I mean, we would work on our projects, my classmates and I, it was, I think there was only six of us in a class because it was just so rigorous and it was through the entire summer. It was kind of an AP course, but we called it an honors course because you can't take AP over summer. <laughs> but we learned so much and we would literally come to school at 7.30 as that's what time our school starts. And then we would go home at like 2 a.m. It, that was just how much we loved our research project. So I'm a total nerd. That's incredible. <laughs> really yeah. Well, especially considering Moana, the film is so much about the ocean and being in exactly. tune with your culture. And then you just to... like stepped in and decided to tie everything together for me. And that's also one of the questions I have for you today is what from your culture did you really want to bring to this project? I, I love this film is inspired by my culture, first of all. And I kind of just bring everything I know about my culture into it as well. I've grown up in an island all my life, just like Moana, and I'm very deeply rooted in my culture. I mean, I I have gone to an all Hawaiian school. That's where I go to school right now. And the message and the folklore of Maui is something that I've grown up with. I mean, literally bedtime stories of Maui. That's that's how it, it works. It's amazing. Me. Yeah, I mean, I, I really love this story, and I love how much time the directors have taken to to put it together and to research and to travel to different Polynesian islands and to have an oceanic story trust as well made up of fishermen and elders and wayfinders and storytellers that just brings the story truly to life. It really it resonates throughout how much uh, love and passion, um, not just through the music, not through just the voice acting, but visually it's a stunning film all the way around. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we have these really adorable videos of you and your mom finding out about uh, you getting the role, and your mom is so precious. <laughs> How are you, it's been a couple of years since you found out and then recorded. How are you guys feeling now? I think it's been actually just over a year, and it's been a very busy year for the both of us. Mom is actually, I think, right outside the door. <laughs> she, she's never too far from me, which I really appreciate. When everything is new like this, I mean, I'm in a new place, with new people, wonderful yes. people, but I mean, the, she's the one thing that will always forever remain constant for me, which I really appreciate. She still makes me do chores, which is actually kind of nice. It's grounding. Exactly. And and I, I appreciate the person I've become today because of her and her upbringing of me. And, yeah. Oh, she's that's awesome. sweet. I love my mama too. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you, I know when I was little, and I might be dating myself a little bit here, my favorite Disney princess was Pocahontas. And I was like, I'm going to be Pocahontas when I grow up. And I was twirling around all the dresses. I was really into Disney princesses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering who outside of Moana is your favorite Disney princess? Mulan. Yes, the fighter. Her. Absolutely. It was like, she's kick butt. Like, she's pretty. She, she can, like, huh. <laughs> I, I loved her. I mean, I, I also thought that she broke a gender norm. And I realized that, like, at a young age. Mm. Not saying that I like specifically said like she's breaking a gender norm and I love it, but I realized that she was doing things that that previously only guys could do. Yeah, and I thought, what the heck? That is like freaking amazing. It's kind of uh, jarring. I remember when I first saw Milan, I was like in middle school, I think, but I remember being like. As you say, you couldn't really call out what it was you were feeling. You were like, I have never seen this before. I always see the girls behind the guys, like the one pretty girl that hangs out with a group of, like, right. kick-butt guys. Oh, but from, yeah. Yes, totally. But for Mulan to be out in the front, leading the way, sword in hand, like, freeing all of the China, like an entire I country. Know. So cool. Exactly. And I, thought, and I thought, like, Mulan's love interest was kind of like the arm candy, because I thought he was, like, He's so fine. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's the bad button. I mean, like, we've seen more fighting scenes with her than him. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> I love her. Uh, very cool. The other thing I want to ask you about was, um, you sang in the movie, right? You did I both? Did. Yes. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> there is a reprise in there. I won't give anything away, because I don't like spoilers either. But you... Belt out your name. Moana character belts out her yeah. name. And it's the most crystal clear note. And it's so <laughs> beautiful. Have you been singing your whole life? Did you take a lot of lessons before the movie got started? Um, yeah, I have, I think I've been singing just straight out the womb. I, <laughs> I 
my mom didn't give me a binky when I was a baby, so I screamed and developed a wonderful one. <laughs> And so I credit my singing voice to my mom, but before this I didn't take any singing lessons. I was part of my school choir, my church choir, um, but now I'm a voice teacher and I feel so like, so regal. Ooh. Ooh, I meet with my voice teacher twice a week over Skype, <laughs> and, and we basically just talk the whole time. But yeah, I'm working my voice, and so it's really interesting to now have, to now be called like a singer or an actress when I'm like, I don't. I just, I've always been like that. That's crazy to me. That's wonderful. So what what happens now? You've done this movie, and you're into science, and you're getting close to graduating high school, right? Um, I'm a junior, yeah. Shh, please don't mind me. I'm sorry, we won't talk about applications <laughs> and, and filing for things. No. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure. This is my first job. Okay, pretty good. Pretty it's very good. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's what's on the horizons for me. I'm really I'm really excited for anything that comes my way in terms of film, but I don't want to to let go of what I've learned and what I want to pursue in science either. I'm so nerd at heart. Thank you. I feel you. Um, yeah, and I I think while I was at school like I'm always known as like that bubbly person and who sings and that girl who sings and that pretty girl who sings and they're like wait you're you're in a molecular cell like biology program and i just want to make sure that everyone knows like yeah you can be pretty and smart and be a like well-rounded package girl you do you (laughs) i i just want like my friends to know that and i want like girls like young girls to know that too that don't limit yourself just because other people want to limit you you know, I was almost going to give you words of comfort of, like, look at the Natalie Portmans and the Minnie Kalings of the world. Right? You do the Ivy Leagues and then go on to be their own showrunners and directors and actors. But you, like, you already know. You're already <laughs> on the path. You're like, I got this. You don't need to worry. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm so glad that it's you that girls get to look up to now when they're looking at, you know, their heroes and their voice actors. And it's good to you out there doing the science and the stuff. So congratulations on your first job. It's Thanks. pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I guess one more thing. What would you tell uh, girls and boys excited to go see the movie? I guess what are you hoping for them to get out of it? I'm really hoping for for young women and young men to identify the journey that Moana goes on. Not saying that they have to connect to like the hundred mile journey across the ocean, <laughs> but the journey of finding yourself. That is something that Moana goes on, and I think it's so universal that yes, young children can realize that, but even beautiful women like you like I think everyone can identify that and solidifying who you are through that journey it's something that everyone should go on and I think something that's hit kind of main media is that Moana doesn't have a love interest because that journey that she goes on she doesn't need a love interest that's all about her and it's an amazing journey thank you so much for joining us today thank you In our final segment, we go to New York Comic Con. This is a roundtable interview featuring one of the actors and two of the show creators behind the new TV series called Beyond, which premieres next year. In this segment features actor Berkeley Duffield, who plays the role of Holden, as well as series creators David Icke and Tim Crane. So from the praises that we've been hearing about you, we should we sort of expected you to have a little halo over your head. I've had praises? That's I great. Praises you, I, I, I like praising. That is very, that's someone saying nice things about me. That's great. Tell us a little bit about the character you're playing in the series. Absolutely. Uh, so my character is Holden, and the uh, story of Beyond is based around <laughs> him waking up after a 12-year call. And it is him finding out who he is and who this, really, this new world really is about and his family has changed all of his friends and and just sort of understanding what modern society now brings to the table and on top of that he has these superhuman capabilities that are a big aspect of sort of him finding out who he is what they are and what to do with them you so at the at the beginning once he's out of the coma does he basically i'm assuming a lot of this is sort of discovering what his abilities are but to an extent, you're also sort of creating the rules for the audience, aren't you? Because, so it's not like the superpowers of the week. It's like once we know what he can do, that's it. Well, I mean, it's you're finding out exactly. He When he wakes up, he doesn't know. It's not, I wake up, oh, I have superpowers. He, he, he figures out that he has them, let alone throughout the season, he figures out exactly the extent of what he can do, what they are, where they came. You know, there's so many questions 
that he wants to ask and originally doesn't have anyone to ask to. And eventually throughout the season, we start to answer those questions very slowly and sort of, exactly, it's it's learning a new superpower with the audience as through Holden's eyes figuring out what he really has now. Yeah. So as you continue to explore this character more, is there anything you found that you're surprised to learn about yourself as a person? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for me, it was it was definitely fun to to read in the scripts of these experiences that Holden got to experience sort of at his at his first and sort of see these things. And it was fun exactly going to revisit almost for me and going, oh yeah, I remember that when I had that happen. I, you know, I remember when I the first night I you know snuck out in you know and went to a party that I shouldn't have in high school. Or oh, I, I remember when I you know was so nervous talking to a girl for the first time. Or I remember you know just talking to my parents as when it's just it was a lot of cool times that you'd see them and I had fun playing with them in the script but as well as when I first read them would sort of reminisce on myself is exactly as there's so many things that he's experiencing that I myself had also experienced growing up so everybody wants to have powers right of course course. why not what powers would you want if you could have them if I could have superpowers uh, I mean I'd love to fly but that's a bit too cliche so uh, what I've, I've always admired uh, in like the X-Men, for example, like Magneto's power of being able to manipulate metal and technology and sort of having that. So I think being able to flick off the lights on and off when I'm sitting in bed or turn the TV channel when I needed to, I think that would be pretty handy. Did you do any sort of research in terms of like, you know, because obviously Magneto has a very certain physicality mm-hmm. on screen, right? So when you're dealing with things, obviously, that you don't actually have, mm-hmm. um, and you're dealing with acting in an element where something is happening, but you're not actually making it happen, yeah. uh, did you do any sort of studying, looking at other actors, what they were doing? Did you go with a gut instinct? Uh, I think it was a combination of all those things. I mean, I am an avid superhero fan from when I was just a little kid. So I have watched so many movies from so many different creators um, that have had these superpowers and as well as exactly when you're reacting to something that isn't there you get to sort of create something new and a new stance a new way of using abilities a new way of understanding them. So it was a really fun uh, way with our uh, multiple uh, amazing directors we had as well as our, our team and Adam, our creators, really just talked through how this character would use them, what it would look like, and we I think we came out with his sort of uh, a very cool sort of mojo that Holden has when he uses his, uh, his abilities. Your character, though, is there like an inbuilt conflict because this is like a line, I think it's in, in the new Spider-Man says, mm. you know, I, I can't, I've got all these abilities, I could be, the, you know, the football star, but I can't because I wasn't before. So even though you have all these things, you can't just sort of go... This is me, man. I could totally agree. And on top of that, with that responsibility of having those, is he cannot just live a normal life anymore. If he just stayed at home wherever it was, the antagonistic forces that you'll see throughout the show know about those abilities and want to harness those powers and use them for their own gain. So he is now forced to protect and become the protector of his family, the protector of the people that he loves, and as well as needs to stay low-key. So, I mean, he can't go and, you know, Exactly, go move a building with his mind when it's in his way or, you know, pick up all the cars and drive through if there's traffic. So there's definitely abilities that he needs to keep under wraps in order to keep himself and the people that he loves safe. What's been the most rewarding as well as the most challenging experience? Uh, I think one of the most uh, rewarding uh, aspects of it would be things like this. I mean, I think having people be interested and be enticed by the show that we've created is really an amazing tribute to our creators and Adam and the rest of our network and our team to be able to create a show that people are going to like. And I think that's such a cool part of my job to be able to come here and tell you about something that I'm really excited about and be able to show the audience now. And it's, it's coming out very soon. Uh, the most challenging part about uh, creating the show and creating the character, I would say, uh, was the creation of it, as uh, we mentioned before. But we were really trying to create something new and something different and being able to take a character who's very rooted in reality but sort of keep the real-life aspects of day-to-day life while having these abilities was a really sort of fun challenge for the writers to have, for us to sort of do in the, in the acting of it. And it was... a. Uh, is a fun challenge. So I don't know how much you can tease, probably not a lot, but I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of twists and turns. First, 
<laughs> how far ahead did you know when things were going to happen in terms of getting scripts? And then two, was there a specific moment or a specific twist that you were just sort of really blown away by? Uh, there are, I mean, when did I have until I realized there was going to be a twist or turn? I mean, I think the first episode itself has very interesting elements that even when I was reading the first drafts of it, I was like, oh, well, that's not what I had expected. I mean, you had to flip back and go, wait, that's the character is saying. So it's a, it's a very interesting way. And I mean, our writers and they are really want to keep you intrigued. And it's a really cool part of, I think, their job is to be able to create those, as you said, twists and turns to be able to do that. I can't say too much, but I will say that there are some, there are some small dynamic twists and turns with characters. There's character arcs that people may not turn out the way they think they are. And as we mentioned before, waking up and being blind to everything and not knowing whose side everyone's on, including what side really he should be on to be in the world, I think you're going to discover that some of the characters introduce themselves and may not exactly be who they say they are to hold them, and especially to everyone else. Somebody said at the top of the conversation, we were talking about the number of these shows that are out there. What is it about this show that is so much cooler than the ones we've seen, or maybe it takes a different take from some of the other shows that were even filmed that are out there? Yeah. Of, of course. Um, I think uh, I will speak to uh, what Adam uh, references in our creator of our show, Adam Nustar. And he, um, we're trying to uh, put on television a really cool take on, as I said, a superhero sort of story that is very much a modern day reality sort of thing where it's the character is rooted in being a young boy and growing up, but as well as endowed with these with these powers. So it's it's a journey for him and not just discovering what these powers mean, but as well as who he is. I think sort of figuring out who he is on that journey is enough to, to entice everyone, but as well as these powers is sort of a cool sort of, I think, a twist on it. How exciting has it been for you to witness just the fan excitement for all this and the whole convention circuit overall? That's it. I'm speechless. I have no words. It is an unbelievable honor to be sitting here to talk to you guys because it means that people are interested and people want to know. And that is everything that I could dream of. So, I mean, I am just unbelievably blessed to be sitting here and I really have no words to show my gratitude that, hey, come watch our show. I think it's cool. And I'm so <laughs> glad and hope that some people think it is too. Are you going to go around San Diego next year dressed as like an X-Men or something <laughs> so you could be incognito? I was going to say, and I'm going to check out the whole exhibit. Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to do it here as well. Too. Or you could just cosplay as your character. Right? And then, and then, and then when even, people comes up to me and they go, and I go, isn't that in that I've working on this for forever? It's all prosthetics. And that's not me. I was going to say, what if I could pull that off? <laughs> I like the guy in the show a whole lot better. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. I love you. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Right, thank you, guys. Could you tell us how you got involved with, with this series, David? Gun to my head. Um, no, I'm joking, of course. It was, uh, it was a very fluky situation. I just wrapped production on a show um, that I was doing with Spielberg at Amblin called Falling Skies, looking forward to a break. And uh, I got a call from Tim Kring, with whom I'd uh, you know hung out with in our earlier Universal NBC days. And he had just set this thing up that I had actually read uh, to meet the writer. Beyond had been sent to me as a sample. Uh, and I passed on it because I honestly, I thought it was a brilliant script, but I just didn't think it could be real, reasonably pulled off on a television budget. And so in that way, it was maybe unrealistic to me. Well, they pulled it off. And so when I saw the pilot, I went, wow, um, this might be something really special. And uh, it presented an opportunity for me to take uh, some very groundbreaking, game-changing approaches to production, visual effects production, and CG on a TV budget that we had perfected during the Battlestar Caprica days and apply it to a new type of show. So we, the visual effects and beyond are unlike anything you've ever seen on a television show before, and that's in part because we had spent the last decade perfecting the system on Battlestar and other shows that we're now able to apply to this. I heard a lot of comparisons in the way that, it, that it's put together. Like, how do you feel about those comparisons? I was uh, a, a kind of a latchkey bad kid growing up, and so I really respond, I think a lot of kids do, to those Spielberg and early 80s kind of Zemeckis movies about kids with their own communities and where the parents are sort of a, an irritant. And I, I really found that, I think in, in superhero stories, 
we, we don't want those parents around, or if they are, we want them around in a way that reminds us of what we're trying to overcome and evolve past. We have great actors playing the parents in this show because once they realize what's going on, they start getting involved, which is not normally what parents do in stories like this. And in that regard, it became an opportunity to kind of reinvent these formulas we've seen again and again. Um, so you've talked a little bit about sort of what brought you to the series. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you share with us what you think your viewers will enjoy most about this show? What makes it unique and special? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, a, a comparison to Battlestar because I think in that situation, people enjoyed the show who wouldn't normally watch a space opera because it delved deeper, it was political, it had to do with things that weren't bumpy-headed aliens. I think Beyond is a superhero show that doesn't feel like if you don't play Dungeons & Dragons, you won't get it. It's a very accessible, very grounded show where the uh, visual effects and the fantasy elements are really uh, commentary analogs. They're metaphors for the things that we experience growing up at key ages that terrify us, that turn us on, you know, make us crazy, that uh, make us terrified or that make us feel safe. Where do those things come from? We don't always know. And in a way, the show is about what would happen if you could go back and figure out what those adventures were that you've been on somewhere in your mind that have now informed who you are today. I guess it has a little bit in common with Inside Out in that regard. What makes you who you are? Uh, there's so many genre shows that are out right now. What yep. sets Beyond apart from other sci-fi shows? I think Beyond is the sci-fi show for people who don't normally watch sci-fi shows because I think it's, it's a story about coming of age, about what would happen if you skipped all of that adolescent adventure, pain, sex, trying drugs, all those things that you do as an adolescent. What if you slept through all of that and all of a sudden you were just an adult and you were expected to behave as an adult, but on some level you haven't experienced all those things that make us who we are. And in our case, with our story, the attempt to go revisit those things that make our character who he is aren't just that time you smoked pot or that time you had sex or that time you got drunk or that time you cheated on the test. It's those ideas represented as these larger-than-life phantasmagoric adventures. So they become symbols for what we all kind of relate to. And in that way, I think non-genre audiences will really respond to it. Can go back to what you were saying before, David, about trying to do visual effects that haven't been done before. Mm. Because having worked on shows that has sort of raised the ceiling for that, like Battlestar and, and Caprica and so forth, I'm sure you're probably aware, like, you know, at some point you're going to hit a ceiling where... You know, I, the technology is only so good right now to sort of raise the bar. Yeah. So what are you doing on this series to sort of bump it up a bit? I've always found that if you treat visual effects like you treat the writing, if you treat visual effects like you treat any other critical uh, component of your storytelling, um, then the story is going to drive the answer to that question. I can create another world that passes the bullshit test for a genre audience, but if you don't understand that that world represents what that character is afraid of, you won't care. You'll be staring at the shot looking for imperfections instead of being with that environment emotionally. So it all starts with the script. It starts with making, creating situations in which those uh, fantasy environments are emotionally rooted so that you want to buy into it because they're meaningful to you as a viewer emotionally. What you guys right now? I literally, on the plane here, was locking picture for episode 10, which is the season finale. So we literally are just finishing up. So do you feel, like, will it kind of on a cliffhanger, or are we going to get some more answers to, like, the mystery? That's got, you know, because right now I'm, I'm like, okay, is it, is it aliens? Is it, but, you know, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, like, who's the man? Like, <laughs> I think the best, you know, having done... A uh, number of shows with that challenge. The best way to handle this is to provide legitimate answers to the audience that pay off what they've invested in, that carry the story forward, that comments on growth of the character, and then a bit of an elliptical dot, dot, dot for what's going to happen next. I feel like that's pretty much what we've done. Yeah. How difficult was it to find the, the right actor? Because I'm sure you'll agree, if you get the right lead, you can, you can get away with a hell of a lot because right. people love your lead actor. But it's not always find, easy to find that perfect actor. I've always prided myself on that. I've always considered casting to be one of my strongest suits as an executive producer. Mm -hmm. And I had absolutely nothing whatsoever <laughs> to do with finding Berkeley, who is a 
discovery. And I, uh, I can only hope I'll get credit for it years later when people forget that I didn't cast him. But I am telling you, he is quite a find. And I don't just mean that as an actor, but as a boss. He's got to be, he's the first name on the call sheet. He's got a bunch of young actors who haven't done this before. And they're walking around seeing their pictures in the magazines now and on billboards and everything. It's it's a perfect storm for a lot of craziness. And the fact that Berkeley is so grounded and sane and smart and such a professional means that the show is actually running like a very tight ship. Beyond that, though, um, I just think he is a star. I just think he has that ephemeral quality of a star. Can you talk about sort of the, the, the mystery uh thriller trajectory of the show because sometimes you have shows that sort of do like that slow build um, and then we get to the climax right at the end and then sometimes we get it we hit it in the middle and we drop back and then come back up for another surprise so what can fans sort of expect or viewers sort of expect from the the thriller and mystery aspect of it like what is the trajectory I feel like we this show builds in a very um, snowball gathering way it starts out where the ideas are are huge, but we don't understand them yet. By the end, we start to understand what those huge ideas were. So it is it, it, with each each episode grows in intensity, grows in in ideas, grows in execution in terms of what you're seeing and and the enormity of the concept. And then you're left with okay, now where does it go next? But at no point in time does it roll back down the mountain and become. Uh, simplistic again. It continues to evolve, I think, in a very compelling way. So about your supporting cast. The, the, um, a little bit about the people you put together, because you, you need a good support team to spotlight your star. Uh, Peter Clemmis is a perfect example. Peter Clemmis and, and Charlie, who is Eden Brolin. Two major discoveries on this show that were cast, one of which was part of the pilot, one of which was cast later. Uh, Peter... The, the, I can't say his last name, who plays Yellow Jacket, you'll get his last name, is a stand-up comic, I did not cast him, who is not only terrifying in the role, but is capturing a very nuanced character and a very nuanced persona. This is not a hitman who just wants to kill you. He does, but he's also a, a, a man, an American man in middle management, reaching an age where he just thought it was going to be a little better than this. And so he's experiencing an existential crisis, not unlike any traveling salesman or anything else. And it becomes this very American story. His wife, who doesn't know what he does for a living, henpecks him for not being able to afford the private school. And we wonder at a certain point, why are we following this character? What does this have to do with a larger mystery? And that is part of the point of what I'm making about the show being a little bit more subversive. It's interesting to watch a villain... Uh, na- being nagged by his wife and not being able to afford the nicer house. It's interesting watching a villain annoyed by the uh, banality of his job. And so not only do these things become quite uh, um, edgy and funny and kind of a Coen Brothers-esque way scenes with this character, but um, they remind us that this show is not playing it by the numbers. Ian Brolin plays a character named Charlie, uh, a young paramour who sort of starts to... Uh, um, uh, compete for Holden's affections and this actress I would build any show around at any point in time in the future I think she's money I think she's absolutely destined for greatness she's hilarious she's sexy she's perfect for Berkeley and her name is Eden Brolin uh, Josh's yeah, well, daughter I'm, thank you yeah. he was very influenced by the kind of um, you know Spielbergian Amblin kind of tone that we all kind of I think loved from the 80s and those kinds of movies but it was the the attempt was to do, to do a show that worked that had multiple entry points that worked as a family drama that worked as a as a, a, a thriller that works as a conspiracy thriller and that has some sci-fi elements and I think partly that's why the show is unique is because it has m- these multiple entries for for audiences. There's even some comedy and and pathos in the idea of waking up in a body that doesn't feel like your own because suddenly he's this handsome young man and he went into a coma when he was this geeky teenager and now he has to learn how to do all of these things that all of us take for granted that we know how to do talk to girls and 
you know, drive and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so that would have been enough to make a, uh, an entire series out of it, that premise. But we then layer on the supernatural and the thriller and the idea that something, you know, something is, was uncovered during that 12 years that he knows that he has to, has, begins to have memories of. And we follow his journey. Right. So every person we've spoken to sort of brings up that weird gap of having 12 years pass yeah. and missing a giant chunk of your life. When you guys were sitting down and you were writing this, were there specific things that you wanted to make sure the audience saw in terms of relating to that that gapped experience? Were there specific funny moments or were there, oh, yeah. Yeah, were there yeah. emotional moments? <clears throat> no, and we explore a lot of that as we go forward. Holden, you know, we get to watch him. It's an origin story, so we get to watch him literally wake up from the coma. But as the show goes on, it doesn't take place in that long of amount of time, the 10 episodes of the first season. So we get to see him, you know, for the first time go to a house party, you know, and, and, um, and for the first time have to learn how to drive or have to learn how to shave. Or that, those, so we're going to explore all of these sort of firsts for him. That that I think the audience will find really relatable, you know, and even though, yeah, even though they don't wish that it happened to them, they'll find that super relatable. So I understand you may have had some experience in the past working with characters that had superpowers. Yes. Um, did you have any sort of reticence about signing on to something that could possibly cover a bit of that real estate, or did you think this was? sufficiently different to sort of... I, I sort of felt that it was sufficiently different, but at the same time, there are similarities that I still find fascinating. I'm sort of not done with that. I think the key part that I find really fascinating is the is characters that are dealing with really existential questions, as opposed to plot questions. Um, the existential questions, to me, are always much more fascinating. Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, what is my purpose? How am I connected to the bigger world? And those are much more interesting to me than the than the plot questions. Right. And um, so the fact that this has the similarity to the heroes thing, uh, you know, I, I I sort of not done thinking and exploring that part. What draws you to telling these stories? Sorry, elaborate yeah. on this, but is there something beyond just the existentiality? Right. Well, for me, the powers are really not particularly fascinating. I mean, because they're they're the they're just sort of the layer on top of it. You know, I was I was a religious studies major in college, and I think I my fascination probably predated that. But um, there has been a thread in my life with my writing and things that I've thought about a lot that seem to to connect to those kind of primal, almost spiritual questions. And I think that at this show also, you know, basically even the, the, the title Beyond sort of tells you that it's about the most basic of questions that all of us have to deal with uh, at some point in our life, and that is what lies beyond this life. Um, if, if there's another realm, what does it look like? What does it feel like? So those are those things are infinitely fascinating to me. And I guess like you know, like a musician that explores certain themes in their music, I'm I, I'm sort of fascinated by that. The Black Girl Nerds podcast is produced by Jamie Broadnax. Various episodes are edited by Jamie Broadnax, M.R. Daniel, and John Bauer. The opening theme song to our show is written and performed by Samus. Various instrumentals are performed by Samus, Sky Blue, and Shubzilla. You can find episodes of the Black Girl Nerds podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spreaker, and Spotify. That was a HeadGum Podcast.